<laughs> That's okay, magnetic. I'm, I'm here with uh, Jonathan Simon. That's his website, and you can learn about him at that website. You can look him up, okay? So let's chat with Jonathan. Jonathan, tell me more about what your book is about. Okay, well, in Code Red, what I'm trying to do is, in a very non eye blazing way, tell the story of what has become of our elections, what has become of our democratic process, the problems that we're facing, the insecurity of the vote counting process, how that's been exploited, and what we can do about it. So it presents a fair amount of evidence of problems in the vote counting our process, and also presents uh, an overview of how that's affected our political system and put us in the position we are now, where there's such a high level of distrust and disgust with our politics, how things are breaking down. And then it goes on to suggest and propose ways in which we can rescue our democracy, reassert public sovereignty, develop an observable vote counting process that can restore trust in the electoral system and in the voting system. I'm of opinion that um, we don't invest enough money in registering people uh, early on and getting people informed about uh, voting options, voting opportunities, registration info early on in age. And I'm also of opinion that um, there's not enough uh, engagement from our OBs. You know, they could do more. That could be a bigger part of their budget. Um, what would you add to that in terms for the voter, what they can do to get involved with uh, the population? Uh, you know, there, there are a couple of branches that are involved in making a democracy work, and one of them is enfranchisement, the registering and ability to vote, um, the taking advantage of that ability and actually going to register, actually going to vote and then the vote counting process itself. And we have problems all across that spectrum. And one of the reasons is that there's been a, as much of a beacon of democracy as America likes to think of itself as, there's been a pretty strong anti-democratic, with a small d, um, strain in our politics from the days of Alexander Hamilton, you know, basically since the Founding Fathers, that really doesn't trust the people, doesn't trust the public sovereignty, wants to control the outcomes of elections and control the outcomes of the politics. So you face some real hurdles in trying to become a participant in the democracy. Well, one of those is hurdles trying to vote. Voter ID legislation that makes it more difficult, even though there's no evidence of voter fraud or voter impersonation fraud. Still, these very cynical bills trying to keep people of color, trying to keep young people, trying to keep elderly people, disabled people from casting a vote. And the net effect of all this politically is to shift the, the politics of the country to the right. It's basically disenfranchising all the left-leaning constituencies, whether that's expressed in general elections between Republicans and Democrats, or primaries between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, or down the ballot in the House races, in state legislative races that are really key to the infrastructure, although most people tend to focus on the presidency and ignore these others. So there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work for voters to do, and part of it is empowering themselves through registration, but another part of it is to take back control of the ownership of the ballots and of the vote counting process and to say look somehow this got outsourced to these private corporations and this country has been going downhill ever since for the last 15 years I mean it's time that we instituted an observable count and that's not going to come from the Senate the House the media you know all these forces are are really uh, unresponsive to this so it's got to come from the public it's got to be in the form of a peaceful revolution I've been proposing opscan parties, which you know, modeled on the old Tea Party idea from not the not the modern Tea Party, but the Boston Harbor Tea Party, that says, look, you know, as a public, we have a right to ownership of the ballots that have been cast. These are public documents, but they're not being treated as such. So we go down on election night, ten or twelve voters surround the opscan, link arms, and say, hey, we're here to fulfill the duty of counting the votes. We're ready to take that duty on, and we have that right. So we're gonna stand here until you unlock the op scan and allow us to initiate a, a public count of those ballots. Now, is this a, a, a not, it's not violent, 
it's a form of civil disobedience that fo that's focused right at the place where we surrender control of the system, where we allow our votes to be counted on computers, unverifiably by a few, a handful of corporations, and we accept these results on blind faith. Yeah. This is something that voters have to be concerned about, as well as their own individual right to vote, yeah. to count observably and be able to observe that count. Tell us more, if you can, about who these corporations are. Well, I wish I, I wish I could go into okay. you know great details, but they're they're pretty without um, getting sued. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. But that's <laughs> not the problem. The problem is there isn't that much information out there. But I mean, people will probably remember and are familiar with Devolt and you know right. the whole issue with Wally O'Dell. I'm going to deliver Ohio to George Bush. Well, some of the people that were involved with Devolt and ESNS are now involved with Dominion and Hard InterCivic and Skype. All you know, these are these are corporations that are very, very secretive corporations to whom we've essentially just turned over control of the voting and vote counting processes. Um, they're basically answerable virtually nobody. Uh, in some cases, there have been lawsuits against them, and those lawsuits have been successful. But in many more cases, they slipped right through the cracks. Um, we don't even have enough information to begin a lawsuit because the ballots are all considered corporate property. The memory cards that are on optical scan machines that most of us vote on, and certainly on DREs and touchscreen machines, that's all considered strictly corporate property. No public inspection. Candidates can't inspect. Even election administrators can't look at them. I mean, this is this is a kind of um, extension of corporate personhood on steroids yeah. that is basically saying corporations are the ones that are controlling yeah. um, the outcome of U.S. elections if they so decide. I mean, I've, I've worked in a nonprofit agency enough to know that when a government gives you a contract and you sign this MOU to sub-service uh, something for them, Everything we do for them is their information, so I don't understand how corporates get away with this with election subcontracts. Well, part of the problem is that the uh, election administrators, whether at the county level or the state level, almost never have the technical chops to effectively oversee the corporations, the programmers, of, the manufacturers and programmers of these machines. So they basically wind up taking it on faith. I mean, it's also a little bit like military contracting where there's a lot of kickbacks going on and all that. Um, you know, this is just not the way to run an electoral system that inspires trust. I mean, what we're seeing now is, I mean, Donald Trump makes a really awful avatar for election integrity, but what we're seeing is somebody coming forward now and saying, I don't trust the system. And I think we're going to see more and more of that for the simple reason that there is very little basis for trusting the system. We, we cannot see the code, we cannot see the memory cards, we cannot see the actual ballots. Um, it's all faith-based, and sooner or later, it's just a matter of time. I mean, it's unfortunate that it's Donald Trump and not somebody more responsible. But it was a matter of time before somebody came forth and said, the emperor has no clothes, or, I can't trust this system. And I think we're at that place where trust is breaking down. That's a very dangerous place in politics. And I'm saying we need to have what amounts to a very peaceful revolution in the way we count our votes, because otherwise our politics are going to deteriorate yeah. to the point where we're not going to be able to even have a peaceful yeah. revolution, where we'll either have something like France in 1789, which is a violent revolution, or we'll have something like what happened under the Soviet Union, where everybody just feels that it's hopeless, and they just uh, basically knuckle under and, and resign themselves to uh, a, the kind of rule that they, that they had for decades in the Soviet Union. So, I mean, one of the points I make, you know, Code Red, it, I, my book, there's a lot of forensics about what has happened with our elections. So, you know, trying to demonstrate that we have a real problem here, that, yeah. that um, the vulnerabilities of our electoral system and our vote counting process are actually being exploited. But more than that, I go on to say, we're not looking to rerun any old elections. We're not looking to take George Bush out of office, even the 2016 primaries. I mean, however dirty that water is, it's water under the bridge. But looking forward, perspectively, we can't take this kind of enormous and stupid risk with the future of our nation, of the world, for our children. This is a huge risk we're taking by allowing elements who do not have the public interest in heart to essentially rig 
vote counts, determine electoral outcomes, determine the leadership of our country, the direction of our country, the policy made by our country. This is way, way too dangerous, and this is what we've been doing for the past 15 years or so, and I think we're seeing some of the results now. So from a poll worker or ballot count observer perspective, you know, I was, uh, I did that a lot in June, part of July. There's a lot of people in this conference that were in that same role. You as a, a writer, a researcher, a scientist, what could we do in that role that can inform you? And two, how do we reach you to give that information? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, unfortunately, the, the problem, as I you probably experienced, is that most of the, uh, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, manure that goes down um, is invisible. So it's very hard for those who are, um, you know, have, have volunteered or are trained as observers or poll watchers to see what's going on inside the computer. What you can keep an eye out for is when technicians come in and bring in patches, which what happens. Is a patch? A patch is a, a recoding of the, of the memory card on the machine. So they would bring another thing that they're inserting into the right, machine. Right, exactly. Bring in a, a Voodoo card. You know, well, a, little, memory, a memory card on a machine is, is smaller than a credit yeah. card. It's well, like at a Michael's like an SD side, card. the M100 machine had been like kicked or something, so. The election day you know, primary was essentially started with a machine whose doors you can just shut. Right. I mean, look, a lot of our equipment is really old, and one of the indictments I have to make of our democracy is that we seem to want it on the cheap. And when I say we, I don't mean the, the public necessarily. I think the public would be willing to put some tax yeah. money to this. Yeah. But for literally... They're donating to this conference, so I think they'll be willing to donate <laughs> right. to you know, the cause. Yeah, and, and even if it was general taxation, I mean, uh, you know, two weeks of our mission to promote democracy in Iraq and Afghanistan. Two weeks cost two billion dollars, and for that you can hand count the ballots in this country for a generation. Probably. I mean, the, the federal yeah. races at the very least, president, right. senate, house. So you know, I mean, we want to, we seem to want our democracy on the cheap, and in that regard, the powers that be. They're not very enthusiastic about empowering our citizens and our public, so it kind of fits with their plan to limit the franchise. This was Alexander Hamilton when he went to, you know, fought against Thomas Jefferson in the early days of our republic. I mean, Hamilton didn't believe the common person knew enough about anything, business or international affairs, to really cast a vote. So the vote was very limited. Well, we still have strains of that today. And if you look at the public, you know, there's times when you look at the public and say, well, half of them are following the Kardashians, the other half are playing, you know, watching football. Maybe they're not smart enough to, to, to vote and know what they're doing. Yeah. But they when can you, count goals, they can count ballots. They could count ballots, that's for sure. But there is a big strain of people who, in the elite positions, in the media and in the government, they're really not that enthusiastic about democracy. They, they won't admit it. They'll sing the praises of democracy, they'll pay lip service to it, but they're not all that excited about it. So that's why I'm saying it's going to kind of take a public uprising. It's got to come from the public. And this is where the public has to take responsibility because a lot of the members of the public feel, okay, my duty to democracy is, yeah, I go vote every couple of years. That's not enough. We have to be participants in a deeper way than being voters. We need to be willing to be counters of votes. We need to be willing to be observers of the counting of the votes. This is not asking that much. I mean, it would take, we've done the math, and it would basically take four hours per voter once in their life. So do you have four hours to go and count votes one night during your life? I mean, I've already served 11. If you know in advance, you can get a sitter or Absolutely. a friend to watch it. Yeah, and it's not asking that much. I mean, I've already served 11 days of jury duty. Most people have served a lot more jury duty than they would have to work as, as vote counters. And that's to have a, a, a hand-counted uh, paper ballot system. To have the kind of audits that would be truly effective would take even less in terms of public participation. But it would take some, because for these things to be transparent, which is what they have to be. If anything is done in a back room, whether it's vote counting on a computer or an audit done in a back room, that is not transparent. There's no, you're subject to the same risk of manipulation. And so in order for it to be transparent, people have to be willing to be observers, to be present. And 
if we don't, we, we treasure our democracy, we value all its blessings, and I think it's time for, you know, from a public standpoint, and I make this point in Code Red, and it's not always the most popular thing to say when I speak, but, you're but brave. It, it's time for the public to say, okay, this is not just a right, we always like talking about rights, I right. want this right, I want this right, it's also a duty. And when we go and say we're prepared to be vote counters, what we're really saying, it's a little like JFK. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Right. We're coming down to the polls and we're saying we are here because we, not because we're asking for something from you, we're here because we want to give something. We want to give our time and we want to give our expertise and we want to be participants in this process and make it a legitimate, trustworthy process. And this is what the American people need to do to step up and take responsibility for our democracy if we want to keep it. Um, you guys know I'm surrounded by amazing people who blow me away. You know, yeah, I've been an advocate, I've been in management, I've done a few things here and there, dabbled, but I've um, never been so surrounded by amazing people who've embraced me as a person of color to learn this stuff. I want to challenge you, if you're watching this, to get involved. You can invest a few hours. He said four, I say four weeks because I did it. I had my family, who I love and thank. Because during the ballot count, canvassing period, the ballot processing, they watched my kids. Um, you know, I didn't have a job at that time, so I was able to invest more time, but I had volunteers who came and did a day, a shift of three hours, and with 30 volunteers, we were able to uh, monitor the ballot counting process, which the RV again calls the canvassing period. So, hey Jim, do you want to give us some final thoughts about this wonderful book that uh, Jonathan wrote? I think it's a good book. <laughs> it's a very good book. It gets people upset, which is good. Especially like the chapter in Massachusetts, which looks at things several which ways and comes out with a conclusion that something's not right in Massachusetts. And the kingdom of God is in Massachusetts. So it's very, I would focus on that for starters, but it's a good book uh, and it could be uh, easily as you read, but it's something that you will find hard to put down. Yeah, I say it's non eye glazing. I mean, it was written to be read, uh, not to be put down. Yeah, maybe we need to get your book translated into other languages so one of us can participate. I've actually tried. There was there was a feeler from a Japanese country, yeah. um, but you know that was from yeah. abroad. Um, so far, you know, we we are hoping to yeah. break through what is with that, the what is English that bilingual edition. app that you people actually translate material when they use books. Oh, I know Google Translate. No, there's, a, book, there's, a, yeah. there's an app where people learn how to speak other languages oh. by actually participating. Oh my God, if you are working for that company, you better uh, <laughs> get on this conversation because I'm doing you a free uh, promo yeah, here. Yeah. But there's an app, and I'm trying to think that it's called Duolingo maybe, but um, um, they uh, really they teach other people how to learn other languages because you're practicing by translating library books. Oh, wow. And so if your book is in the library and people want to learn a word, they look it up, but then they end up, by typing the information in, they're actually creating a, a, a way to expand the translation of that book. That sounds cool. So we got to hook you up with that. It's amazing how hard it is to get a book out there. I mean, anybody who self-published a book and, you know, will know. Um, you know, unless you're J.K. Rowling or something, I mean, even she had a publisher. Um, you know, you really have to just reach out in all sorts of different ways. I'm beginning to learn social media, which you know, I was yeah. pretty averse to for a long time. Um, because people, you know, I mean, this is, Code Red is the kind of book that I believe that there are probably literally millions of citizens and voters in this country that would snarf it up, you know, if they knew of its existence. Um, because it is so central to the, what we're undergoing now in our politics and, and understanding maybe what's happening and what we can do about it. But, you know, that's the real trick. It's like there's so much information out there now and there's so many places to look and getting something noticed, you know, with, you know, unless you're on Oprah or something like that, um, is, is really tricky. So we've been doing what we can, hoping, hoping that people, that it goes viral.
you know? and, and there are a lot of other things. And one of the things that Code Red does is it points to the work of other people, like Jeff, and a lot of the people we heard today in the, in the, in the conference, and tries to consolidate that in one place. So if people want to look further and say, well, all right, you piqued my interest about this, but I want to learn more about it, or I'm not totally convinced, there's all that. There's a bibliography as well. And that's where we, we want to go, is we want to have people just raising their consciousness, raising their state of concern, and raising their sense that there are actions that can be taken and actually must be taken mm -hmm. if we're going to make a significant change. So folks, on that note, I'm going to advise you on Facebook, if your county doesn't have this yet, aside from ballots for Bernie, uh, ballot for Bernie members form their little groups where they can intimately chat about election stuff and electric ballot observing. And so I know that uh, Alameda has a group and it has several, several members. And then San Francisco has a group, Merced, Mendocino, Sacramento, and um, San Francisco, um, and San Diego, I believe. So get on one of those groups or contact us so we can start your own, um, guide you, and keep you connected to our, our list and our database because these experts, uh, they're going to continue to help us. Yeah, we're going to keep engaging them because the general election is coming up and we're going to have more elections in the future that are going to impact your children, you, and um, your life. So. Thank you so much for being uh, with us, and um, I'm just overwhelmed with excitement about our future. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.